Good day, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sean Reynolds, and I have for you here a very extremely special story uh, that I want to share with you. Um, this story has deep meaning. It, I believe, accomplishes in answering many of life's toughest questions, one of which being, what is the purpose of life? And another being, well, why didn't God just kill Satan a long time ago and rid us of, you know, all of the pain and suffering that we've had to endure over the years? You'll find that the story is very true to the Bible. Um, and in fact, I encourage all of you to listen very attentively to every word because every single word, I assure you, has meaning. Every single word of this story has meaning. Every number, every name, every event that occurs. And I encourage you to go and study God's holy word, an accurate interpretation, of course. And I'm, of course, referring to end times prophecy now. And uh, go through and see for yourself how true to scripture this story actually is. And I encourage you, lastly, to put yourself in these characters' shoes, because that's the point, okay? Um, and without further ado, I'm going to jump into this. The name of the story is called 11000001001, also known as The Guilt of a Jew. Now, I will try to refrain from interjecting anything outside of what has been written in the story and so you'll have to really pay attention in order to understand the ending because i'm telling you right now the ending is deep it is so so deep and unless you really pay attention uh, i think that maybe a lot of people won't understand it but uh yeah let's begin part one after I died, my mind took me to a wide open meadow which was surrounded by the most beautiful mountains, gracefully melting with white fluffy clouds in the distance. My consciousness was curious, for even in life I had never witnessed something so profoundly breathtaking. Yet because I was somehow certain I had just died, all I really cared about was answers. In no time at all, I noticed an odd shape in the midst of the tall grass and hesitantly approached it. The shape turned into what was recognizable as a middle-aged gentleman sitting at an office desk with glasses on his brown, graying hair, a pipe hanging out one corner of his trim, bearded mouth, and one hand on an ancient-looking typewriter. His other hand was extended toward me as a come-it's-your-turn expression rested on his slightly aged yet boyish face. I sat down in the black wooden chair beside his desk, flashing him an unsure okay with eyes cocked sideways and one eyebrow raised. In my mind, I figured I had best just go along with whatever was happening. There was a sense of anticipation as I had hoped some answers would come of this, but everything felt very weird. I suppose you would like to know the purpose of it all, the gentleman asked. He spoke as friendly as his face suggested. I was quick to answer, at first I thought of only the last world, but now I'm curious about this one too. Oh, naturally, he said. He drew his hands together and leaned forward. A little bit of smoke from his pipe wafted in my face, but because it somehow had no odor, I didn't mind. After a few seconds of intensely staring me in the eyes, he leaned back again and used one hand to hit his pipe hard. When he blew out, a thick cloud of smoke surrounded us like a fog before gently being swept away by the wind. This world is the afterlife, he said, where all souls go who have left the body. But you're now seeing only part of what's here. The rest will come for better or worse. Instantly, I felt uneasy. For worse? The man grinned, saying, oh, but you have nothing to fear, right? The outcome matches the deed. I swallowed deeply and straightened up in my chair. I thought for a second about my life of whether or not I was truly a good person. Such questions I had pondered many times, but this time I wasn't so sure I was the good person I would convinced myself I was. Finally, I said, right. Of course, the place to begin with is with the Lamb's Book of Life. The gentleman turned to a four-drawer filing cabinet standing behind him. 
Let me just pull out your records. I was confused. Lamb's Book of Life? You're joking, right? He peered over one shoulder at me. A watch says he used his free hand to pull his glasses down over his eyes, which suddenly became much larger. So you're familiar with it, he asked. Of course, I responded. It's from the teachings of that false prophet who led Israel astray. The man narrowed his eyes and sighed. Well, you've made things easy for me, he said, annoyingly closing the drawer and opening another, pulling out a red binder. He closed that drawer and turned to his desk. Since your name is not in the Lamb's book, it must be in this one. Wait a minute, I said. This isn't right. Where is God? I want to see him, not you. I'm a son of Jacob, the man responded, and I've been tasked to help judge the nations. I jumped to my feet. Judge me, I yelled. Only God can judge me. And you say you're a descendant of Jacob? Excuse me. That's what I am. You don't look like me. You're of the nations, not I. The man remained as calm as before, seemingly not responding to my escalating anger. He opened the red binder and pulled out a red booklet. Opening it, he flipped through some pages, then used his finger to find a certain spot. There we are, he said, as expected, your name. Father, I said, bring me before Father, he's my judge. The man leaned back in his chair with the red book. It says here you're a Satan worshiper, is that not correct? Absolutely not, I yelled. I devoted my life to God. I kept every single Sabbath. I banged a fist against his desk. This is a joke. I know it's just a joke. This is not a joke, the man said, pulling out his pipe and slowly twisting it around and around in his hand. Had you chosen to acknowledge truth during your life, you would have expected to see me. You would be gleefully bouncing for joy right now because your name would be in the Lamb's Book of Life. But Jesus was an imposter. He taught things contrary to established laws and customs. He called himself the son of God himself. What blasphemy? And what right have you to call me a Satanist? I prayed to God, not Satan. I honored the commandments of God, not Satan. Define God for me, please, he said. I gently cleared my throat. <clears throat> we cannot speak his name, but I will spell it. Y-H-V-H. You mean Yahweh? This is not how it's spoken. You insult him. The man quietly sighed and shook his head. I was in a high state of alert. I think my hands were even trembling. For real, my mind was in utter confusion, but the strange gentleman never changed demeanor. There is something you must come to terms with, he calmly told me. Your forefathers lied to you, but because in life you chose to believe in this lie, you too are held equally accountable. It's all written in the scriptures you conveniently deny. You know of Jesus and his holy book, yet you chose repeatedly to renounce these truths in favor of a pretty lie, one which benefited only you and your family. Again, had you dedicated your time to accurately interpreting God's holy word in full, you would now understand what's happening and know the extreme severity of your situation. I placed both hands on his desk and angrily leaned in his face. The Messiah which you speak of, the one who is so great, where is he now? It seems even in the afterlife he remains invisible. That's when I felt a warm hand rest on my right shoulder. The gentleman across the desk quickly stood to his feet and smiled, placing both red book and pipe on the desk in the process. I spun around to see what I could only then compare to an angel. Never had I witnessed such warmth and beauty, such majesty. A sensation of feelings instantly passed through my body, and before I knew it, I was on my knees, crying like a newborn. I can't explain what happened. It's like my body knew something my mind just didn't. It is I, the one you spent your life rejecting, the angel said. Now turn your body toward my bride and repent to him for the endless pain and suffering your kind has caused my bride over the many years. Sobbing and weak, I spun and faced the son of Jacob, who appeared like he was expecting this. Saying not a word, I hung my head like a dog in shame. Tell them you're sorry, the angel said. His authoritative voice shook my nerves to the core. In my mind, there was nothing conceivably worse than what I was feeling. With every fiber of my being, I wanted to resent the feelings of remorse and dread, but my fear was too overpowering. How do I know you are who you say you are, angel? I said between sobs. 
The angel walked around me and stood next to Jacob. I could follow his movement until he disappeared around the desk. Stand, the angel said. I wasted no time. It was incredibly awkward and I felt very weak, but I managed to at least face in their direction. I think I tried to focus on the mountains in the background instead of their eyes. This is why I say in the gospels, the scribes and Pharisees hear not my voice, for they are of a different flock, the angel said to Jacob. This is why his name was never in the book of life, he continued. Why, even today, he hears not my voice. I hear you just fine, I butted in. Even still, he continued, facing me, he understands not the words of God. This is when I mustered up enough strength to say, I was a chief rabbi, fluent in Kabbalah, Talmud, and the writings of Moses, as well as the other prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel. If what you say is true, how so, angel? Jacob calmly responded while the other one stared at me. Respond to him as Jesus. The angels were created below the father and son and even below the pure human races. You will respect him for who you know he is. I know nothing, I yelled. This is trickery. Is this your final answer? My mind stopped racing and suddenly I was confronted with a voice. Final answer, I thought. Is this a test? Are there real consequences? Suddenly I blurted out, wait. Everything fell horridly silent as my voice disappeared beyond the grass. I looked the Holy One in the eyes with a shudder. I know what happens to those whose names are in the red booklet, I said. Since I'm familiar with Christian ideology, it's assuredly the eternal lake of fire, a sudden moment of unsureness, correct? He nodded his head, yes. Okay, I said. So what I want to know is, is there another booklet besides the one in the Lamb's book? He smiled, which was unexpected. There is a temporary one, he said, which serves as a placeholder until you reach the end. This buys you a little more time before your ultimate judgment. But do you qualify? I rolled my eyes and crossed my arms. You tell me. No, you tell me, he said. The words of your mouth bring life or death. It's entirely your choice, just like it was your choice to consider the possibility of another book and present your inquiry before me. You knew of this possibility at this time solely because of your passing knowledge of Christianity. I pondered a second, then said, so let me get this straight. The alternate book could also bear my name, and if I so desire, I will not be damned to hellfire? In a way, yes, he said. At this point, you have but two choices, either the eternal lake of fire with Satan or endure the millennial reign outside the gates. My mind recalled the moments leading to my death. It was the words millennial reign which triggered this memory. It was supposed to be the messianic age, the age of global utopia on earth. The simple fact I had died just five months into the long-awaited Messiah's reign unfortunately proves our vision was false. Yet, as disturbing as this was, I didn't want to abandon the truths I had been taught my whole life. There's no way the rabbis were wrong. This would mean all the signs and wonders they performed was done so through demonic means, that I was another fool for trusting them. But still, a tiny part of me wasn't entirely sold on sensuality. I was starting to feel betrayed by my own people. I hesitantly said, what happens after the millennial reign? He replied, at the end, you will enter into one of two places, either New Jerusalem or the eternal lake of fire. Again, the choice is entirely yours, but you must make it before the end. There will be no more opportunities after this. What if I just accept you now? Will you let me enter into paradise? No, because you would be accepting me out of force and necessity and not from the heart. But wouldn't I be doing the same thing next time around, knowing I had better accept Jesus or be cast into the fiery furnace? If you serve me only out of fear of judgment, then yes, you would be, simply because your love wouldn't be sincere. But how is your love toward me sincere when you're forcing me to love you or be punished? 
You're asking me why I expect those whom I graciously allow into my perfect heavenly kingdom to honor and obey their king or else be rejected from the kingdom? Mind you, if you won't honor me in life, why would you honor me in death? Why should I let such a person into my eternal kingdom knowing he will resent me and break my fair rules? Wouldn't that be unfair to the others who would have to suffer because of your sins? That's the purpose of the test, the purpose of life on earth. You're a dictator. You force everyone to conform to your ways or be forever tormented. I'm the creator, the only image of Yahweh anyone will ever know. My rules are fair because they're rational. Those who make wise decisions succeed while those who are ignorant and lazy fall by the wayside. My rules hold the universe together. They bind all things under a fair order of dominion. Because my laws are universal, everyone and everything benefits who obey. I'm a fair dictator over a thriving empire. It is by my grace alone that you're even standing here allotted this great opportunity. And this is only because I think you have it in you to love me. Love, I said, <laughs> that's a strong word. There's a part of me that would rather burn for eternity than love you. I'm aware of this, he replied. And that's precisely the choice many of your friends have made. But since you stand here before me with the same secretly unsecure, skeptical mind you possessed in life, my bride and I have found it in our hearts to grant you your desire to attempt to know me. I rolled my eyes. My desire, I said, to figure out a way around this, you mean? There is no way around this, he said. But you may have to learn this the hard way. The choice is entirely yours, but it's a choice you've been given. It would be smart to choose your destination wisely. The longer I stood in their presence, the stronger I felt, and the more compelled I was to take their statements to heart. Perhaps this was solely because I had no other choice. I wasn't about to gamble whether or not they were lying, not here, not with the stakes possibly being eternity in hell. And if they were telling the truth, a part of me felt grateful for this second chance, but I've always been stubborn. It took everything in me to finally say, then make it happen, buy me more time. Jacob opened another drawer, pulled out a yellow binder, then sat before the typewriter. He pulled out a page, inserted it into the typewriter and began typing with pipe now back in his mouth and puffs of smoke rising in halos. There are some questions you must ask yourself, the Holy One said as he walked around the desk and stood before me. First being, what amount of evidence is required to make you believe, and is it a rational amount? The second, what does it mean to truly love me? I stared back at him, solemnly holding my words inside. Truth is, there was so much I felt I needed to know at that moment. It was hard to go along with his obviously lengthy program. I suspected my questions would be answered, but not at my preferred pace. Finally, I said, where are you sending me? He glanced back at Jacob, who had paused his typing fingers and responded, your old home where you left off. It's only straight below, before resuming. But it was destroyed, I said. There's nothing to go back to. The whole earth was destroyed, the Holy One responded which is why you will join the others in enduring the millennial reign in your spiritual bodies, the one you're in now, and live on the scorched earth? You could be in paradise right now, enjoying freedoms unimaginable, but you chose in life to renounce me and persecute my people. This is what you chose. I warned everyone of these things through the very prophetic books you have always renounced. All right, I get it, I mumbled, wishing to be out of his presence. Just send me back so we can get this thing done and over with. It is your choice, he said. For better or worse, it is all your choice. My eyes beheld as around me a dark circle formed on the ground. I wanted to take a step back, but my legs wouldn't move. One last thing, the Holy One said as a strong wind encircled me. Be on the lookout for a man named Jacob. He'll find you, don't worry. And then he said, I bid you farewell, my child. The circle on the ground around my feet then turned into a hole and my body was instantly sucked down until I found myself falling through a red sky down to a blackened earth below.
Part Two. When I awoke, I jumped to my feet and gazed around in disbelief. Once beautiful landscape rendered to crumbling black ash, a cloud of smog hovering over the distance in every direction, a blood red horizon reaching up to dark and dreary skies. It looked like how I would perceive hell on earth to look like, which horrifyingly made me question whether I had actually been sent to hell by mistake. But then I focused my eyes on the gigantic city, one side hovering in the air about 3,000 feet directly above me. I could tell by the angle it was a city because of its long shape and size. I surmised it was the place I had just fallen from. The underneath disappeared in a thick body of white clouds and around where the kingdom hovered was well lit. I could see the entire kingdom seemed to be surrounded by a large wall with more than one gate. And from the furthest side from me appeared to be what looked like a waterfall, gracefully falling from the city to earth. I knew what I was looking at because of my Christian knowledge. This was the heavenly city of New Jerusalem. It appears those like myself who thought it would be a kingdom in Israel were wrong. Just like I was evidently wrong for believing in the messianic age and for accepting Apollyon as savior which made me recall a memory. Apollyon, the angelic man I once worshipped, was comparably weaker in majesty and grace than the holy one I had encountered just moments prior in the hovering fortress. But most disturbingly, I had witnessed Apollyon become disintegrated by the coming of the bright light that killed us all. If my Bible memory serves me well, this could have been when Jesus returned to earth to gather his flock on the sounding of the seventh trump. Something about his glory killing the Antichrist and the material earth and everyone on it being burned up. Okay, obviously this all happened. Apollyon in the world was destroyed and none of his promises came true. I was standing there below a floating kingdom in my spirit body. I couldn't deny these facts. They were literally staring me in the face. So was I convinced? <laughs> Not a chance. I thought to myself... Okay, the matrix is real. My mind could hardly fathom what my senses were taking in. But I wasn't left alone with my thoughts for long before out from around an ashy hill appeared a group of five or six people. They stopped immediately when they saw me making not a sound. This gave me a moment to gather my thoughts and anticipate the smartest move. I'll speak first, I thought. I was just sent down, I said, pointing an index finger and glancing upward from there. One of them stepped forward and timidly replied, we know, so were we. Just now, I said, a few minutes ago, the man hung his head and glanced back over one shoulder. Seems we've all been dropped off at the same time. Silence. Finally, I said, so what about monsters or other terrifying things? Any Christians present know what we're up against out here? We're all Christ believers, one of the other people said, but we were expecting to be raptured away before anything bad happened. When Apollyon appeared with his army and began abducting people with their spaceships, we thought we were witnessing the rapture. Apollyon did so many wonderful things, we thought he was the savior. We thought Christ had returned and he was summoning the Zionist age of global utopia, heaven on earth. Another person said, I for one rarely read prophetic texts, so I have no idea what's going to happen to us out here. Then a third voice rang out. I suppose there are no Bibles remaining if all the buildings have been turned to ash. This was a good point. Perhaps if we were to get a hold of a Christian Bible, then we would know what to expect. But gazing around, I found no sign of man-made anything, only blackened hills of ash and soot for miles around. That's when I said, why don't we head toward that waterfall? It looks more lively in that direction. So we treaded slowly across the thick, ashy terrain toward what we hoped was a beam of sunshine. I didn't want to remember this place as it appeared before, beautiful and lush. It was easier imagining it a completely different place on a foreign planet somewhere. Even the bodies of water were dried up. 
At some point, I looked around and saw that we were standing atop what was once the Mount of Olives, where many of my ancestors were buried. My eyes began to water up. I noticed one other person from our group was crying and hesitantly asked her what she was thinking. She responded, and it startled me. This is where Jesus resurrected from the grave, she said, wiping her nose. They buried him in a cave somewhere over there. I didn't bother following her finger. Instead, my memories took me back to the year 2019 in September, when I stood along with the other Sanhedrin members atop this very mountain and reinstated Noahide laws. I watched as my brother slaughtered a living lamb on the altar we had made. Blood poured from its neck as it uttered its last cries. On that day, we formulated the 71 Nation Council On that day, we solidified the Zionist world order. It was such a joyous event for my family and I. This was instrumental in summoning the messianic age, and only a few of us understood the significance of what we had done. I stared at the woman, ash clouds puffing up around us, and thought, what had we done? My eyes fell as I tread through the ash. It wasn't supposed to end this way, I thought. I glanced over in the distance at what was once the Western Wall, and beside that, the Temple Mount, where the beautiful hybrid Jew and Muslim and Christian temple once stood. Everything we had dedicated our lives to, gone, I thought. My mind returned to the Mount of Olives. The woman beside me rejoices in Jesus' resurrection while I rejoice in his non-existence, or rather, as the Talmud puts it, his eternal damnation in boiling hell, I thought. I automatically chuckled at this as I always had, but then I suddenly fell very sick to my stomach as it occurred to me, but if he's an imposter, why has everything he said would happen come true? Why does Apollyon's kingdom now lay buried under piles of ash? Again, I'll revisit the Matrix theory, but since it could neither be proven nor denied, I shuffled this idea to the back of my mind until later. Meanwhile, it only felt logical to entertain the possibility that this was all indeed real, unless somehow this was a crazy acid trip there was truly a lot at stake. This made my mind return to the words of the one I've been calling the Holy One. He said, what amount of evidence does it take to make you believe? I looked back over at the woman. You cry over him, yet you're here now, I asked. Her face went solemn. She delicately put her hands together. After a moment, this is what she said. I was brought up Catholic and was a devout believer for many years, but falling away from religion altogether eventually. I thought my savior knew me just by occasionally doing the confessions to multiple priests and paying tithe to the Vatican. But as my judge explained, this was not what it meant to love the Lord or what it means, I mean. I was slightly taken aback. This was when I asked her, does anybody even know what it means to love Jesus? So far, two or three Christian Zionists and a Catholic haven't figured it out. What chance do you think I have? You must have one, she said. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I want to believe you, I really do, I said. But you see, I spent my entire life believing in and teaching a complex doctrine centered around denying Jesus as Messiah. It's because of this we for over 3,000 years were in waiting, hopefully anticipating for the true Messiah's final appearance. Sure, many rabbis over the years fell for the false messiahs that came and went, but when Apollyon came around, the whole world was convinced he was the one, and it was we rabbis who hoisted him up and gave him a platform. His appearance lined up beautifully with our prophecies and what we have been hearing. I still cannot understand how we were wrong. 
She reached out and calmly took my hand. Rabbi, she said, I'm learning one of the obstacles we must overcome is admitting we were wrong. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? We were wrong. Why don't we start from there? I slightly smiled, but it was no time at all before I slid my hands away from hers. I used to call her type Acom, that of the nations. While I shockingly understood this no longer meant anything, I still found her close presence uh, a slight infringement on my personal space. Even still, I pondered her words as we silently trekked toward the waterfall in the distance. Could I have really been wrong? I asked myself over and over. Could I be wrong even now? I was reminded of the other people in our group when one of them suddenly said, well, this is interesting. We all stopped and gazed about a hundred feet ahead as a giant glowing man with wings, an angel perhaps, watched us from where he stood right next to a fairly large pit which almost blended in with a black round. I wish you no harm, the giant said, stabbing his sword into the earth. He confidently walked around the pit and extended a hand toward us. Come here, there's something you must see. I already don't believe what I see, I thought. But after we approached the pit and stopped, I was even more amazed. Look, what do you see, the giant with wings asked. We gawked with disgust at the smell alone as we peered down into the pit, but I'll never forget the way the creature looked, its deceptive, ghastly, decrepit appearance, like a shriveled up rat with no hair. Who or what is that? Someone asked. Don't you know? The giant responded. It's the king of the dunghill, the serpent himself. See how far he has fallen. It was then when the creature in the pit snapped its head around and gazed directly into my eyes. Before I had time to respond, it said, don't think it's over yet. It is written, I shall have another chance and you will stand beside me again, my equal. I was baffled yet I needed to know more. What do you mean? I asked it. I thought Jesus won the battle. Only temporarily, it hissed, as is written. My first response was to question the giant. What does that thing mean, I asked. After the millennial reign of King Jesus, he responded, the dragon is released, but for one short while, to tempt the world again, before the earth is destroyed and the dragon is cast into the eternal lake of fire forever. We'll see if it's but a short while, the creature barked. I have many tricks up my sleeve. As is written, the giant said to the creature, in the end, you will be cast into the eternal lake of fire where you'll burn in torment for all eternity. He walked around and pulled his sword out of the earth as the creature spit profanity. Then he added, after which <laughs> I'll never have to guard you or this wretched pit again. No, because I'll be guarding you in the pit, the creature said. You and Jesus and your... The giant waved his hand open hand and suddenly the creature's words could be heard no more even though his mouth was still moving also thankfully the stench went away the choice is yours whether or not you believe satan actually has a chance against christ the giant said everything else that has been written has come to pass why wouldn't satan's ultimate demise happen too of course it happens everyone was saying but I kept my words to myself. Not to mention, the giant continued, when you know the Lord, you trust the Lord. He has never failed us, and I believe he will never fail us. I completely trust my life and my loved one's lives in his hands. I needed to say something. What about the Father's hands, I asked. I hear everyone speaking of Jesus, but what about God? Where does he fit in? Jesus and the Father are one, the giant calmly replied. Yes, that's what I was told before, but I still don't understand. The giant authoritatively looked us each in the eyes as he spoke. It is impossible to know the Father without first knowing the Son. Jesus is the observable form of the unseeable Yahweh, the material version of himself. 
He was God's very first creation. Long before even Abraham, Jesus the Lord was with God and he was God. When both Yahweh and Jesus recreated the earth, all pure human races were created in Jesus' image and likeness as he was the first human mold, if you will. When Moses spoke to God through the burning bush, he was speaking to Jesus, the son. The Lord prayed to by all the Old Testament prophets, including Daniel and Isaiah, was none other than King Jesus, the son. It wasn't until King Solomon defiled the Lord's temple with foreign idols and welcomed foreign nations into the family when biased historians and scholars started writing Jesus out of memory, considering the Lord and God the same unseeable entity and completely forgetting about King David's own writings about God's son. So this is when God proposed a new marriage decree, he continued. He allowed Solomon's temple and all preceding temples to be destroyed stating, I live not in houses made of stone, and don't you know that you are the temple of God, your soul? Also, he proclaimed, I forgive you for the many sins you've committed, which is why you are no longer required to burn offerings and honor past practices that were in place because of your sins. Since you are forgiven, and this is a new covenant, my only requirement of you is that you forever honor my son Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth as it was before you fell to pagan idols. In doing so, this is now the only way to please me. The great giant paused, then looked directly at me and said, This new covenant should have been happily embraced by your people, by all people. But instead you rejected this proposal and continued mixing pagan idols in with truth, believing that you were still wedded to God until what remained of the true faith was an abomination before the Lord. I rolled my eyes. That's not how it happened. Oh, my Israelite ancestors record how, yes, we fell to sin, but then later on, we were restored when we began honoring his commandments once more. He replied, yet you still deny his son? We were never taught that his son existed. It says nobody sits beside God, does it not? How can someone who is one sit beside himself? He replied, ah, this is lunacy. The giant sarcastically grinned, yet you stand before me, he said, in a spirit body, which is separate from your physical form. I was dumbfounded by this response. It was deep. In fact, I think we all were. You were created in his image, correct? The giant asked. You have had both a spiritual form and a physical form, correct? And this is when something in my mind clicked. A genuine revelation. And I could not deny the sense of it because I was in fact standing there in my spiritual body, which was obviously separate from my physical one. I was too startled to speak. The giant continued, the Lord even used the prophets to tell the world, I will send down to you my only begotten son so that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I will do this for several reasons, to eliminate all doubt that I do indeed exist by not only fulfilling the prophecies, but also by showing you my face, and also to serve as a living sacrifice to forever atone for your sins, which I have forgiven. Through this selfless act, our Lord and Messiah became our Savior. He indeed kept his promises, and today he sits at the right hand of God, figuratively of course, back where he has always sat. The giant again paused to look at me. This time I saw slight anger in his eyes and I immediately felt fearful. The synagogue of Satan, he said, has been in power ever since Cain was banished to Nod. He glanced downward at the ugly creature in the pit. See him? Those people are his offspring. When they worshiped their father, they were worshiping him. I covered my face with both hands and turned away from the pit. Nothing but confusion and fear was in my head. 
I snapped back around and angrily faced the giant. This is not YHVH, I yelled. This thing wrote not the books I honor. Oh, but he is, and he did, the giant calmly responded. Explain. Even with the Old Testament books you acknowledge, you perceive ancient history without having the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. And with all your other holy books, Jesus is portrayed as a bastard who corrupted the world and was deserving of his fate of eternally boiling in bodily fluids in hell. When the Father says, nobody can come to the Father except through the Son, and you in turn call his Son an imposter, do you really think you're honoring God in any way? Do you really think he hears your prayers and bestows upon you his blessings? He leaned toward me a bit, pressing his sword slightly deeper into the earth. Do you really think you're wedded to him? No, it has been this abomination in the pit to whom you've been sacrificing innocent lambs. It has been the old dragon who hears and answers all prayers that are not mediated by the Lord Jesus himself. My eyes fell. I became very weak and sick feeling. But worst of all, the giant with wings continued, is how your people, ever since the fall of Cain, persecuted God's people, those who truly acknowledged the Lord Jesus and kept his fair commandments. Your people pretended to be something you weren't, while persecuting those who truly were what you pretended to be. But then why were we so blessed, I wearily asked. We had everything, controlled the world. Surely that creature didn't give us these things. Wasn't Israel blessed because of, I'll just say it, Yahweh? Only to the extent of letting you live in hopes, he replied. Hopes that you would accept truth. Otherwise, any blessings you received was derived by corrupt, dishonest means, instigated by your father, Satan. I want to throw up, I mumbled. True Israel, he continued, on the other hand, has always been blessed. Those who truly acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior, and who consist of the twelve Israelite tribes who were scattered by your people long ago to all corners of the earth, God called Jacob Israel. This is true Israel. The Zionist Israel ruled over by the pagan sons of Cain who infiltrated the temple during Solomon's era and reigned off and on until the seventh trump was not true Israel. You and your cross-denying family, descendants of Cain, are not true Israel. Lies, I wearily barked. Cain's descendants were all destroyed during Noah's flood. I am a descendant of Shem. You are believing lies, the giant replied. But perhaps the reason you're now standing here before me is because you really are ignorant of your family's past. I suppose already you have a lot to take in, but now consider this. He pivoted his head and looked around at all of us. You all believed in the Zionist cause, he said. Every one of you chose to believe in the lies begun by satanic rabbis who never knew Yahweh, whose agenda was always to conquer over the world and force God's true people into systematic enslavement or face genocide. You know New Jerusalem is not of this earth. Just look up, see with your own eyes the one and only truth, and look around at what has become of the Holy Land. God warned you long ago, if anyone comes in my name claiming to be me, and the people say, there he is over there in that house, believe them not. For when I return, the mystery of God shall be fulfilled, and what is perishable shall become imperishable, as everyone on earth takes on his glory." Yet you ignored his warning and accepted Apollyon as a savior anyway. For five long months, for some of you much longer, you joined together with all nations of the world to target and persecute God's true people, the whole time claiming to be that yourselves. Yes, all of you standing here are guilty. You all willfully have sinned and you all chose the mark of Satan and murdered those who did not. A few of the others became upset I have no blood on my hands, one said. I killed no one. But you did, the giant said. Everyone who shared the Zionist agenda of global utopia. I meant the Zionist age of global utopia. The vision governed over by the sons of Cain 
all of you are guilty of murder. The Lord said, you're either for me or against me. And since you chose the Zionist vision over truth, you are never for Jesus, but for Satan, who is the father of murderers. I could sense much dread in the air all of a sudden. I suspect the stories were true about Palestinian persecution, one of us quietly said, but I can't take responsibility for what happened to the rest of the world. The giant quickly responded, by supporting their cause, you are equally responsible for what happened to the whole world. Just then I recalled the words of the creature in the pit. Equal, I thought. It told me we are equals. Precisely, the giant surprisingly responded aloud, looking me dead in the eyes, because at this point you are equal. The only thing separating you from him is the fact you've been given a second chance he could never afford. Is your name Jacob? I asked. A boyish smirk appeared on his face as the anger faded away. Then he kindly replied, My name is Michael. I've been close with the Lord ever since creation. In fact, it was I who captured Satan first time around, <laughs> then again just a little while ago. And when I release him again, I'll be there to catch him yet again. Thank God that'll be the last. I couldn't help but ask, why didn't you just cast Satan into the lake of fire the first time around? He gently replied, because the Lord keeps his promises, every last one. I pondered a second. I don't understand. He turned his eyes down into the pit and said, it may be true in a way that even the dragon has a choice to make. This was surprising. I finally replied, does that mean his destiny is not set? that he could change and God is giving even him time to decide? It means, he said, God created all living beings with a free will to choose left from right, right from wrong, life from death. Let me ask you, how many innocent lives are on your hands? Is this any worse than what Satan has done, especially considering you were his arms and legs? Now think of this. Is it better that you had never been born or that Satan should long ago have been destroyed? Remember, God sees the future. He has foreseen the birth of all of us, every last one. Had your father been destroyed, would you now be standing before me, granted this opportunity to accept what you know deep inside to be true? I slowly turned away from him, intensely listening to his words terrified yet somehow secure over the fact he could hear my thoughts. He continued, the Lord is gracious to forewarn us of his timeline through prophecy. That being said, even Satan has an allotted timeline, which we've seen. There is reason behind everything. Coincidences do not exist. We know which choices Satan will make simply because God, through his infinite wisdom, has foreseen Satan's actions and foretold his plans to us. Yet in regards to the final battle, Satan has not yet performed this deed. So for that, he cannot yet be judged. In a weird sort of way, I understood him. God is not the author of confusion, the giant said, turning his back toward us. With that being said, I think it best you all continue your hike. As is written, this place is about to get even uglier. There was an instant uneasiness amongst us. What do you mean, someone nervously asked. Can you tell us what to expect out here? To that, Michael casually responded, glancing over his left shoulder. You should have studied his word while you had the opportunity. You know, the outcome matches the deed. And so we quickly left that area traveling onward toward the waterfall. It wasn't long, however, until trouble struck, and I do mean literally. Part three. Large boulders fell from the sky, lightning flashed, and a mighty wind stirred up the ash around us. We could hardly breathe through the madness, let alone see where we were going. In utter chaos, it was every man for himself. I departed the group and sprinted as fast as I could in a straightward direction, barely catching several boulders with my hands before covering what felt like a great distance. 
I wasn't sure what running should accomplish, but it seemed better than standing still. I ran and ran until suddenly I felt the ground cave out from under me. My body fell probably 20 feet before painfully crashing against a hard surface. I jumped to my feet, waving my arms through the air as piles of ash fell on my head, unable to see anything. But after a moment, the chaos died down and I could barely see the light that trickled down that I had fallen into what I thought must have been a cave. It made no sense stumbling around in the dark, so I moved out from under the hole and sat down and waited for the storm to subside enough to hopefully see. I had no idea I would be sitting there until what felt like days had passed and my body became both uncomfortable and hungry. Boulder after boulder of various medium sizes fell through the hole and occasionally one would bounce in my direction. Because of this, I had to remain ever on my guard. But during that time, many thoughts raced through my mind as I delicately recalled the new memories I had made, each one frightening me more than the last. And then, after all that time, I finally stopped hearing boulders falling and lightning flashing and the wind blowing and sat for some time in a state of shock over how silent it became. Then I could see. Enough light emerged from the hole to light up my surroundings. As the ash settled, I gazed around in utter astonishment. It occurred to me, I know exactly where I am. I stood and walked around the room, emotionally reaching out to the piles of ash on the ground, which once formed the idols that adorned the temple. This, our synagogue, I moaned. Beneath the western wall where no atomic bomb could penetrate, our direct connection to him. I became lost in my thoughts. I recalled the many times I stood in this very temple, sacrificing much more than my time for the coming Messiah. And when Apollyon appeared, he first greeted us in this very place, the place from which we had long since communicated with him. I angrily pounded my fists against the blackened rock walls. Why did I trust them, I begged of myself. Why? And then it occurred to me, I rode over and crouched on the floor. It's not their fault, I said, solemnly staring across the dark room. It was I who prophesied many times and many things, who spoke directly with Apollyon and heard his answers. I fell apart in tears, crying, it was I who led them astray. Some time must have passed when out of nowhere, I heard voices echoing down the hole in the roof. I jumped to my feet and ran over to the hole, climbing part way up the mound of boulders piled on the floor. I could hear people moving rocks out of the way from above. Hello, I yelled, can you hear me? I was thrilled when a voice rang out. There's somebody down there. Y yes, we hear you on the way. After a moment, two heads peered down at me and one of them said, oh yes, I know what this place is. The prophet Ezekiel spoke of the abominations that happened here. And then he said to me, is there anything left? I was slightly confused, but sorrowfully answered, only ashes. The man ironically laughed. Sad thing is, I knew of the Antichrist agenda, yet I still ended up in this place. He shook his head and stood. I could no longer see him, but his voice could still be heard as he said to the other man, here, help me toss in some of these boulders. I was alarmed and yelled, wait, wh what's happening? The man peered back down into the hole. If we're going to get you out of there, he said, seems the best way is to make that pile you're on bigger so you can climb to the top. Oh, great idea, I relievedly responded after a second, then climbed back down the pile and backed into a far corner. As they tossed boulders over, some larger than my torso, I happened to look over at some point and see something shiny buried in the wall beside me. When I dug it out, I recognized it immediately. This is a jewel from one of our sacred items, I thought. I clutched it in my hand and gazed around to see if anything else presented itself. Finding nothing, I stared down at the jewel and wondered, why was everything destroyed but this? Wishing to keep the item, yet not wanting to have to carry it around everywhere, I put the jewel in my mouth and hesitantly swallowed it. By this time, the boulders had piled high enough to almost reach the ceiling. 
One of the men tiredly yelled down at me, okay, try it now. I clambered up the pile, embracing their downreaching hands, and before I knew it, I was back on the surface. First thing I did was look around. The ever dark and dreary skies, the redness everywhere, nothing had changed. Except now, instead of ash, the ground was covered with blackened boulders, literally covering every inch of earth as far as we could see. Then I turned my attention to the three men standing before me. Yes, I was surprised to find three instead of two. Thanks, I said. I thought I was going to die down here. The man I had been speaking to sarcastically grinned. I think I wish it were only possible to die here, he said. Then the other man I had seen through the hole timidly added, looking me in the eyes. The pain is there, but death won't come. When the boater started to fall, the first man said, we all were caught with nowhere to hide. While it seems you had a roof over your head, we were out being continuously pounded by the falling boulders. It was hell, the second man said. For months this went on. This confused me. Months, I asked. It surely was, the man frustratedly responded. I spent my life in the military. I learned how to keep track of time. And for months, I tell you, we three experienced hell. I turned my mind inward and thought, no wonder I'm starving and thirsty. No wonder my mind and body feel so exhausted. Then I thought, but why did they suffer a worse fate than I? I remembered the words of Michael that coincidences don't exist. But then it felt pointless thinking about this as evidently only months out of a thousand years had passed. I had escaped this one, but what fates awaited me? The first man interrupted my thoughts. Your face looks familiar, he said. He glanced at the ground, then looked up at me and rubbed his chin. Weren't you one of them? Wait, y yes, your face told the world Apollyon was the Messiah. It was your arms that embraced Christians for the first time. You who systematically forced the world to accept the mark or be persecuted and killed. Is that why you're here? The third man unexpectedly asked him taking a few steps forward to join the conversation, he seemed ideologically distant from the others. The first man's anger seemed suddenly dissipated into sorrow as he calmly responded, it's nobody's fault but my own. Of course, Satan's people never had our best interest in mind. I didn't want to die. I conformed to a system I knew deep down was of Satan. He burst into tears and covered his face with his hands. I called myself a true Christian yet I bear the mark of the beast. This was when he turned his back to us and showed us a small tattoo centered on his upper back. And still do, see it? He terrifyingly asked, the number? We stared at the tattoo as one of us read off the number. One zero, one zero zero, one one zero one zero. Do you know what that means? The first man cried. It's binary for 666. It's Satan's number. Shock on our faces, we each looked at each one another's upper backs, finding the exact same tattooed number. If we bear his number, does that mean we're his? Someone questioned. Are these things barcodes? The third man, who seemed less surprised than the rest of us, then responded, that's precisely what they are. All eyes were on him. He calmly continued, no sense in hiding it. I was a high-ranking computer programmer working for the Zagu. My crew wrote the algorithms they used to follow and censor everyone on the planet. We each had a unique number, and then each of us was assigned only one of two numbers. He stopped and glanced upward at the floating city. Then he said, the number we bear and the number they bear. I don't understand, I said. He quickly replied, sure you do. It was long before Apollyon even appeared. You and the others told me and my team to develop a way to covertly regulate who could and couldn't be heard. Those who conformed to our system was granted a voice. Nonconformers were kept silent. Remember, this was how we ensured only our propaganda was known. My head was spinning. Now it made sense, of course. His words were true. I covered my mouth with my hand and silently listened as he continued. This world had to believe the system was good. We controlled the opposition, and we blessed only those who were on our side. 
How else do you think we made those mobile tracking apps possible? If not for every person being tracked and categorized by a number, those live cell phone maps showing the location of every person alive, including info like if whether or not they had received the mark, they had no idea every few seconds their cell phones were shooting out infrared lasers to scan their environments, or that also their faces were continuously being scanned and saved in their own personal files. His face became slightly angry. This was how Apollyon knew who his equals were and who to target as enemies. This was how he knew every one of our faces and all our deepest desires. I felt compelled to say something. It's all true, I admitted before them all, bringing both hands together behind my back. I'm just now realizing the specifics of it all, but I'm sad to say that yes, it's all true. They stared at me as though they were expecting this. Not an ounce of shock was found in their eyes. I hung my head and hesitantly continued, uttering words I thought I never would. Seems we were wrong. Seems I was wrong. Some time passed as we slowly clambered across the ground as a group, heading toward the waterfall which seemed to be getting only a little closer. We were mostly silent. I could surprisingly sense no resentment toward me from the others. And then I realized it was likely because we all were guilty of our own crimes. As I internally beat myself up, they were assuredly doing the same. Days have passed, the first man said at some point, breaking the silence. Even though the sky never changes, I can tell we've been trekking for days. Is your name Jacob, I asked him. No, he responded, but maybe ask him. He signaled toward the third man who walked apart from the group. No, I've already recalled his name, I disappointingly replied, and it's not Jacob. Finally, we came upon a body of water, the first of any sort we had seen. It was a large lake or small sea. I wasn't sure if it pre-existed the destruction, but upon enthusiastically trying to drink it, we quickly realized it was salt water and spewed it out. This is undrinkable, one of us cried. Oh, how I thirst for pure water. We looked as best as we could, and the sea seemed to possess no life. This only made sense considering, but it was a nice thought while it lasted. But the water's edge looked somehow comforting, so in spite of our disappointment, we decided to break there from our trek. It wasn't too long before each of us became ill, and we were scratching all over. Gazing down at ourselves in horror, we each realized our bodies were infested with loathsome sores, sprouting up out of seemingly nowhere. How is this possible, someone begged. We are not in physical bodies. It's because we bear his number, the first man cried. This is the beginnings of many plagues to come. What do you mean, I frantically asked. The first? Seven plagues, described in Revelation. Horrific sores, followed by other horrors. I thought maybe they had already passed, that we were on the other side of all that. Oh no, that's when we can no longer bear the pain. To me, it felt like my entire body was on fire. I ran and dove into the sea. The others ran behind me. This at first seemed like a huge mistake as the salt in the water caused our boils to scream with even more agony. But after a few minutes, the pain subsided some and it seemed as though the salty, lukewarm water was helping. And so this was how it was, day after day, month after month, as the sores kept us close to the sea. We longingly gazed at the beautiful waterfall in the distance, but knowing our sores would worsen without the salt water, we felt it wise to put our trek on hold. The first man at some point updated us all on what the seven plagues were, and so we all waited with fearful anticipation for the second one to occur. We knew with this one we would have to move, so in a way we were enjoying the sea as long as we could. And then sure enough, the day came. It happened when we were all standing waist deep in the sea, reminiscing about happier times in the past. I believe I was actually the first to notice, but it didn't take long for anyone to know. I disturbingly said, it's happened. But by then, we all were scrambling to get out of the water. 
I wasn't expecting it to burn, someone cried. It must be the iron. Before long, we stood along the water's edge and peered out at the blood-red sea before us. He always keeps his promises, one of us said. Now we must make it as far as possible before the next promise is kept. And so we left the blood sea, traveling along many miles before suddenly it began to gently rain. That's right, pure, non-salty water started falling from the sky. The coolness of it soothed our pores and the sensation of pure water touching our tongues was unimaginably remarkable. We drank and took delight in what we were unexpectedly experiencing. This made me realize even during trials, the creator is fair. For weeks we trekked onward, and for weeks rain gently fell on our shoulders. But we knew this leisure wouldn't last long, for sure enough, the day came when the fresh rain turned to blood droplets, and we again found ourselves in excruciating pain, scrambling for a place to hide. Part 4 Together we endured the pain of the blood rain until finally finding a place to hide. It was unexpected that we should happen upon a small ledge, and we desperately stood together underneath it, perched like hens in a coop. When the rain finally ceased, we ventured out to enjoy the open air. I should note how bad it smelled, but at this point we didn't care, as the only thing on our mind was enjoying the air before the next plague should come. This was perhaps the plague we were all dreading most. We wasted no time continuing toward the waterfall, which still seemed so far away. If we were to endure the coming heat, we thought, it seemed likely to benefit us to stand beneath the waterfall. That's the best place to hide. Does anyone even know what the waterfall is? I asked. I mean, why it's pouring down from the floating city? The first man responded, Healing waters, a blessing bestowed to the nations from above. But we got to get there first, someone aggravatedly responded. <laughs> it's not much of a blessing until we reach it. This made me think, do those with Satan's number ever gain access to the waterfall? I questioned aloud. The others stopped moving. I realized I had presented a possible dilemma to our plan. The third man, the computer programmer, soon said, is that why we seem to be getting no closer to the waterfall? It was a moment of truth. Some of us found a boater to stand and rest on as we verbally contemplated our options. Finally, the computer programmer said, It makes sense we should never gain access to it. I mean, it's like an algorithm keeping our number away from his. Why didn't I think of this before? Our only option is to somehow change our numbers. Is that possible, I asked. Must be, he smartly replied. Otherwise, I don't think we'd be here. But how is it done? No clue. While we were yet waiting there, instantly appeared before us two men and a woman, wearing bright white robes and having about them a peculiar glow. It totally caught us off guard. A few of us jumped out of fear. They gracefully stood there, smiling, as one of them said, Fear not, for we are missionaries of the Lord sent from above to minister the, to those who seek to find. I, for one, at first was terrified, but quickly I found it in me to be calm. One of the others in our group nervously said, the prophet Jeremiah spoke of these things. Indeed, the missionary replied, because God keeps his promises. We're here to help guide you on your way, the woman missionary said. Ask and you shall receive, search and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open unto you. The computer programmer spoke up first. How do we change our numbers, he asked, pointing to his upper back. We seek to get to the waterfall. The woman replied, there is but one person alive who can change it. He alone can handle the transition, but you'll never find him until you find the son. So first step is accepting Jesus. Okay, let's say I've done that, he said. Then what? Then you must love the Lord with all your heart. I've done that too, then what? Then you'll need not ask for Jacob, because he'll be there. My eyes widened. Jacob? I said. You said Jacob can change this? Yes, she replied, calmly looking me in the eyes. But you must first find Jesus. 
Yes, and love him with all my heart, I somewhat sarcastically responded. I heard. But how does this help us now, the first man chimed in. I have accepted Jesus, and I've been trying my hardest to love him, but still I'm here. What more do we need to do to qualify? One of the male missionaries responded, It is written, the outcome matches the deed. You must all suffer what has been sown, what has been put in place by none other than you yourselves over the years. But I was a good Christian, the first man expounded. The only thing I did wrong was accept the mark, but only because I was afraid. Then you have hurt the Lord most of all, the missionary calmly responded. How so? Because you knew the truth, yet you still chose to fear Satan over God. He opened his arms at the desolate landscape. Tell me, he added, whom do you now fear? The Lord, the man cried out, falling to his knees in tears. Now I fear the Lord and none other. This was when I interjected. Over these past months, I've found it in my heart to accept some people who are different from me. Why can't Jesus do the same? I believe you've already been told that answer, the missionary kindly responded. But I'll elaborate. Only he knows what is truly fair and just for all. Only he can perceive each of our future paths and know the proper balance of left and right. Then he gazed around at all of us and asked, Do you really think the creator of all the universe doesn't know what is best for his own beloved people? He's seen all alternative routes. He's calculated his plans around our choices and even intercedes on our behalf when we don't know it. And that's why you're here today, because he loves you so much. He's giving you every opportunity to accept truth and love him. Of course, the choice is entirely yours, but it is the Lord who has granted you this opportunity. What is truth? I begged, slightly annoyed, and it was written on my face. How can I be sure this all isn't just a computer simulation and my mind isn't in some jar somewhere? Yes, it feels real, you know, real, but, you know, he patiently replied, you can't. Do you think that feeling ever goes away? I've seen places beyond your imagination, felt sensations no unsafe person would believe exists. Do I ever get over the amazement and wonder of it all? Never, and I think that's the point. So if you're hoping that feeling ever goes away, um, you're going to be disappointed. I pondered his words as he continued. Consider this, he said. Even if you did wake up someday to find you're only a brain in a jar, would the feeling then become that you're really just a mouse trapped in a virtual maze or a materialized reenactment of someone's imagination? At which point do you draw the line and say, this is me, this is real? The other male missionary then authoritatively spoke the question you must ask yourself, he said, is, would you rather spend the rest of eternity deciding if whether or not the matrix is real and what could possibly be a simulation of heaven or of hell? Because either way, it's going to feel real, simulation or not, brain in a jar or not, your experiences will be real. You will forever either feel the torment or the pleasure. It was becoming easier to admit they were right. As much as a part of me hated it, the more rational part had to admit their words made sense. I deeply evaluated myself and knew that no matter where I find myself, where I found myself, I would always question the very fabric of existence, never satisfied with knowing only that which could be measured with my own senses. It had for many years been my devout practice to honor a God I thought I knew because he answered when I spoke to him. And when he finally showed his face, I kissed his hand in praise. But even then I wondered to myself ever so slightly, is this real? What other hurdles stand in our way from believing? I questioned myself, how much evidence is enough? The miraculous things I had witnessed Apollyon and his army doing convinced me enough of his position as savior and king, yet I now find it hard to accept 
Jesus as Savior and King after the far more miraculous things I'd experienced because of him? The question I asked myself was why? Even the logical part of me seemed to understand I was being irrational, if that makes sense. Why am I this way? I softly mumbled, asking this question before them all. All eyes were on me as I wearily said, I should be one way, but I'm not. I'm opposite of what makes sense. Then abandon your old self, the female messenger kindly responded. Do you think I'm the person I was before accepting truth? But how? Am I not still held accountable? Am I not still the man I've always been? She replied and smiled. Yes, but it is you who have chosen to carry the load of your sins because you fail to accept the gift of forgiveness your Lord bestows upon all who accept and love him. One of the male missionaries calmly interjected. However, irregardless of when you decide to accept his gift, the tribulation timeline must still be fulfilled in full. It is written. In this place, the outcome matches the deeds of the last world. The deeds of this world will match the outcome of the next. However, there are great benefits to accepting Christ's gift as soon as possible. For one, the weight you carry on your shoulders will vanish. And for another, I abruptly asked, the numbers on our backs will change? The missionary nodded his head and thankfully he replied, indeed. But then he added, of course, after you've met Jacob. And then as the missionaries were yet speaking to us, my stomach began to churn. And when I threw up, there appeared on the rocky, bloody ground the sacred jewel I had many months prior swallowed in the temple. My first thought was to reach for it before anyone saw what it was, but it was to no avail. When I embarrassingly looked around at the missionaries' faces, I was surprised to find not shock and confusion, but glee. The others, however, looked confused. This is progress, one of the missionaries happily said. You could have held on to this until the end but instead you've chosen to let it go now. What just happened? I asked, nervously wiping my mouth with my hand. He replied, Your spirit now finds something it once loved so intolerable it spewed it out. The others gawked with astonishment as I thought to myself, It's true. I now find my past a disgusting memory I want only to forget. But I was shocked to hear the first man say, I don't understand. Does that mean the memory I swallowed is a relic of a past I should forget and not take delight in? What was it? The missionary asked. As a Christian, and while I was buried during the boulder storm, I felt compelled to keep a tiny growed, golden, I mean, cross. I had seen shimmering every time the lightning struck. What need has a living God for idols? It's a cross that commemorates what he did for us. And if that's all it meant to you, the witness sternly said, you would have etched its meaning in memory instead of swallowing the mere embodiment of it. I don't understand, the man desperately cried. I worship not the idol, but the Lord. And out of nowhere, I said, I threw up my idol because it now disgusts me. We flashed that idol around before millions, I mean billions. We took great pride in believing it represented Moloch. I took great pride in knowing the cross I wore everywhere on me represented Jesus, he said. Then the female witness said, even while bearing the mark of the beast. The man drew quiet as the missionary then patiently asked him, it was then all for show, was it not? the cross. His face turned Sodom as he slowly withdrew from the rest of us. Did you not proudly show off your cross while knowledgeably guiding those who trusted you to accept the mark, telling them it wasn't really the mark of the beast? The man collapsed and cried out, it was I. And as we wept, we inquisitively spoke with the missionaries until they gracefully departed us, and we again found ourselves heading toward the great waterfall in the distance. Part 5 Some time passed before the dreaded fourth plague arrived. 
We felt it as soon as it started. In spite of the darkened skies, it suddenly felt like an oven had been opened, and it increasingly grew hotter and hotter as time passed until we retreated inside the shelter we had constructed out of boulders and blood and shut out all sunlight. This was only working for a little while before it was no time when the heat inside became intolerable. Fortunately, one of us thought to start digging, and so the further we went, it was a bit cooler until we each were buried quite deep in boulders. Now what? We questioned amongst ourselves, yelling loudly, then holding our breath so as to somewhat hear each response. We curled quarreled over the decisions of whether or not we should have kept traveling toward the waterfall or stopped to dig a deep hole to hide in. We begged the Lord for mercy, angrily yelling out in pain. Still, the heat only grew worse and our emotions only intensified until finally one of us broke. It was me. Yes, I caved in and angrily cried out, curse the Lord curse God. It grew very silent. I had no idea what the others were thinking. Instantly, I felt not the heat anymore as the only thing in my mind was the echoing sounds of my own voice screaming those terrible words. Then, as a little time passed, I began to notice the heat really had subsided. I pushed aside the boulders and climbed out of the rocky mound, seeing that the others were quietly doing the same. We stood there on the surface, battered and bruised, toasted, and emotionally stared at the nightmarish terrain all around us, silent. I was the first to speak. Yeah, I said it, I said. Okay, now God and you all know my level of devotion to him. I guess now I've failed his test, now I'm doomed to hell. I think we all wanted to say it, someone quietly replied, but I for one would have kept gritting my teeth. For how long, I said, until our bodies and minds were scrambled like eggs? He tiredly responded, I can somehow imagine hell being much worse. I glanced downward and gently kicked the edge of a boulder. I'm sure you're right, I said. Then I looked him in the eyes. But why was it even necessary? Is God finding pleasure in our suffering? The mostly quiet computer programmer then said, after a moment, Rabbi, what we all just felt, he covered his mouth like he was going to puke. Then he silently continued, was what it must have felt like for every person we brutally murdered over the centuries. My eyes widened as he began to cry, gazing above. Oh, Lord, Lord, how we're deserving of so much worse. Then the first man, the true Christian, spoke up. There are still three plagues to suffer and many hundreds of years left to endure. And as he spoke, he broke down in tears and asked, then will the outcome have matched the deed? The computer programmer softly replied, hanging his head, even then, I don't think so. In fact, as long as we bear Satan's number, I fear the rest of eternity will always bring horrors somehow worse and worse. But I just cursed God's name, I nervously interjected. My destination is set. A terrifying chill ran up my body. And then I wept. Is this why you said I'm not your son? My voice rang out as I wholeheartedly raised my fist to the heavens. Why you said the reason I don't hear your voice is because you're not my father. Did you foresee this moment and know that I would curse your name? And then it suddenly occurred to me as I lowered my arms, that I'd been cursing his name since as long as I could remember. Each time I sacrificed to YHVH and Apollyon, each time I denied Jesus and prayed to Satan, I was cursing God's holy name. This was nothing new, but more still, I looked down at the others. All of us All of us have been cursing his name, I loudly said, every time we reject his love. And then it hit me as I quietly said, to love the Lord is to accept his love. One of the others thought and then said, and to accept his love means, I blurted out, to accept his his gift of forgiveness, meaning uh, to forgive ourselves, meaning 
And finally, I said to repent after we've hurt the one we love, the one we know who loves us. That's when I closed my eyes and bowed my knees in true repentance. I said quietly to Jesus words I never thought I'd utter. Lord, please forgive me. After that, a pause as I contemplated my next words. Then I prayed. When I embraced Noahide laws and forced the world to conform, I was rejecting your love, Father, because I knew not your son. Now I've found Christ and I want to ask him to abide in my spirit, just as that demonic jewel had once abided there. Lord, please continue to hold me accountable for the terrible sins I've committed, for I am ever deserving of it. But please, Lord, also continue to bless me for the good things I do, so that hopefully someday my life will become easier. I'm truly sorry for cursing your name, Father. I stopped and thought, I am truly deserving of much worse after what I've done. He could have increased the heat even more after I cursed his name, but instead he reduced my sufferings. And I curiously said to God, I wish I understood why that happened. I thought, there are no coincidences. The words of your mouth bring life or death. And then I had my answer. I doubt anyone else or anything else could have convinced me to open my mouth to discover the revelations that followed and to be there at that moment opening my mouth yet again soon thereafter i had someone look at my upper back to tell me if my number had changed before he could respond i enthusiastically knew what the answer was it has he gleefully expounded you've done it i was beyond ecstatic Suddenly, I thought to look toward the waterfall and sighed with great relief when I realized it looked much closer, truly obtainable even. Then I thought about Jacob and confusion struck. I thought only Jacob could change my number, I questioned. I looked around and said, my number has changed. Where's Jacob? This is peculiar, someone said. We wasted no time traveling as we pondered and occasionally spoke. Even the others had an extra skip in their hop over the realization it was achievable to change their numbers. But I was especially anxious to reach the waterfall because I knew my number finally matched its and there would surely be a wonder to behold once there. But I couldn't stop thinking about Jacob. Obviously, if my number is reliant on him to change, I thought, yet it changed without me seeing him, it's likely Jacob doesn't mean what I think it means. I considered everyone with me. By now, I knew that none of them were named Jacob, but did one of them maybe represent Jacob? This idea took me down multiple trails of thought. I began with, what might it mean to represent a Jacob? What does Jacob represent? Who was Jacob in history? Abraham begot Isaac, who begat Jacob, who was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. God told Jacob, your name is Israel. I then began to understand the puzzle. I thought, Jacob is Israel. I am Israel. But a terrible thought entered my head. I prayed quietly to the Lord as we trekked along. My judge introduced himself to me as son of Jacob. I was led to believe at that time that I was not a son of Jacob, but the son of a different father. Then I heard from Michael the mention of Cain. If his bloodline wasn't ended during Noah's flood, does this mean his descendants were alive even until the seventh trump? And if I'm one of them. Is that why Jacob was never my father? Is that why I'm not Israel? My confusion grew. But if I'm not Israel, I thought, why has my number changed to God's? But because you're no longer the person you used to be, a clear voice kindly answered in my head, the first of its type I had ever experienced. I was surprised yet not frightened. I thought, so if I'm no longer rabbi, uh, who am I? 
Then like a ton of bricks, it occurred to me as I thought, Israel is his. Jacob means Israel. I smiled as I quietly said, I am Jacob. The computer programmer beside me heard me and asked, what was that? I stopped walking and grinned like never before. The others also stopped and were obviously suspicious. I said again, I am Jacob. Then I excitedly continued, and every human who bear his mark is Jacob. They thought a second, then one of them asked, uh, even I can be Jacob? Yes, you can. I unexpectedly found myself bouncing with glee. So that's why I had to meet Jacob before having my number changed. I had to find myself for I'm the only one with the authority to change my number. And that's why you had to find Jesus before finding Jacob, someone added, because you can't truly know and love yourself without first knowing and loving your creator. Hallelujah, I yelled, gleefully dancing around like a ton of bricks had been lifted off my shoulders. I suddenly cared not about my surroundings, for nothing could distract me from the happiness I felt inside. But before I could indulge in my delight much longer, the fifth plague began. I suspected its occurrence brought great and sudden fear to the others, but I was more taken aback by the confidence that now swelled within me. This will not be as easy as I had prayed, I heard the true Christian say. There is now but enough light to see only a twinkling from the waterfall. How will we navigate these rocks now? By following me, I excitedly said, for it seems the waterfall appears much farther away for you than it does for me. Its faint light is lighting up the pathway before my feet. So we reached out and found one another's hands and formed a chain. Then suddenly, slowly, we began to traverse the dark, rocky plain, carefully communicating with one another along the way. For a long time, we trekked along, even the city above us, darkened from our view. It felt like carefully navigating a boat across dark, still waters. Time passed ever so slowly with a dreamlike feel, at times impossible to differentiate reality from imagination. I was sure I was yet imagining another image when suddenly I realized we had reached the water's edge. Outstretched before us was a blood-red river, I searched my mind for clues. We have been walking eastward, I thought. I can't believe it's still here. We were looking at what remained of the mighty Euphrates River. Or rather, I was looking, the others still strangely could not see. I broke the silence after we halted. Seems we will eventually witness the sixth plague unfold before us. Perhaps the heat won't be the worst plague we faced, after all. I somewhat nervously said. It was the true Christian who tiredly asked, what do you mean? I replied, before us stands a bloody version of the great river Euphrates. And before I could finish, he said, which will dry up right before the dragon is released again to tempt the world one last time. Yes, it seems God is giving us a front row seat to everything. Then he almost jokingly added, it is our lot, I suppose. We knew we could travel no further until the river dried up. With nothing to construct a boat out of, it was useless even trying to think of traversing it. And going around seemed pointless, since it would take us far out of our way, and we knew the river would eventually dry anyway, leaving the only rational choice to sit and wait. Some things unexpectedly happened during our wait. The true Christian actually became a true Christian, after he threw up the cross he had swallowed. Then soon thereafter met Jacob and, like me, had his number changed. He and I grew close as brothers after this, as we both possessed something the others did not. We truly were brothers, it felt, and one day we questioned the others about this matter. As we were all sitting there next to the river, some in more darkness than others, he kindly asked them, after everything, what is holding y'all back? Their response varied. One said, because I don't think I can ever forgive myself enough to accept his forgiveness, but I'm trying. 
And the other said, I've already thrown up in secret. You don't know what I can and can't see. The second response set us aback. Then later we secretly spoke amongst ourselves. He still bears Satan's number, I said, but so did we for a time after we threw up our idols. He replied, but his hint at maybe being able to see makes no sense. That cannot be done without first accepting Jesus and Jacob both. I agree. And I thought to myself, so this is how it's done. Had I not seen the light with my own eyes, I likely would have believed that this man could see. And I would have believed it when he told me he bare the mark of God when he didn't and likely followed him wherever he should lead. The sixth plague began when the Euphrates dried and all that stretched between us and the waterfall was barren, flat, rocky earth. The darkened state remained unchanged, but because the terrain became easier to navigate, those who could see but a distant twinkle thankfully kept confident enough to guide themselves. Because of this, we covered distance much faster than before. At some point, we Jacobs conversed about what to expect when Satan is released. I, for one, was anxious over the thought, partly, uh, partly because we traveled with two people who bear his number. Will he have authority over them? I asked, almost afraid. Then I added, for that matter, will he have any impact on us since we're now gods? Gods, yes, he thoughtfully responded, but still trapped inside the pearly gates. I mean, outside the pearly gates until what has been written is fulfilled, yes, that unfortunately too. But we mustn't forget, this is all still part of the test, I forebodingly replied, half responding and half thinking aloud. We mustn't allow ourselves to get too comfortable at any point. I suspect those numbers can change back to Satan's if Jacob so desires. Part 666 When the dragon appeared again, it was much like before, except now it was Satan himself instead of his now deceased puppet Apollyon. But he appeared not as he did at the bottom of the pit. No, now he took on a disguise of its own, a beautiful angelic body in place of his true ugly self. We first ran across his party after what felt like days of traversing the seemingly never-ending dried riverbed. First thing I thought was, as expected, his advanced technology has been taken away from him. This is why he flies not a ship, nor drives a vehicle. Like us, he has been rendered naked, with only legs and arms through which to traverse. For there were many with him, both man and woman, all with angry and demeaning looks on their faces. Their leader spoke, his voice sounding sweet as honey, yet I knew underneath was a serpent's voice. I could tell by the way at least some of you can see me that some of you have accepted the number of the bastard. He looked at me and said, as he stared deeply in my eyes and laughed, you've fallen for his lies. What a fool you've turned out to be. Once my equal, now this. I kept my mouth shut, thinking it would give him no means to continue hounding me. He grinned that fake boyish face and said, but you know, it's not too late to change sides. This was when I attempted to catch him in his first lie. I confidently asked, how long do I have to choose? He arrogantly replied, not long at all. And for how long will you rule? Forever, it will be I who is guarding Michael and Jesus in the pit. Then he snarled, and I'll be guarding you as well with that number on your back. I thought I was being smart when I responded. Then forever you'd rule, yet for only a short time you'd give me the option to serve you. Is that rational? His comeback was much faster and more confident than expected. He smiled and said, you mean like how Jesus has done with me? I admittedly was startled at this seemingly wise response. At first I thought, he's right. But it took no time before I realized the truth and then said, 
how can you say you have no choice when you've yet to perform what has been written of the final battle? What if you choose to follow your brain instead of your heart and decide to not confront Christ once more in battle, but to admit you were wrong and repent for your sins? Then I thought to myself, even in heaven, surely the option to serve or disobey him still exists. He sarcastically entertained my question. It was written on his face. Let's say I did choose him, he finally said, prancing around before his followers. Would that not make your Lord a liar since he has already foretold that I should seek to destroy him? Again, I found his words wiser than expected. Yet upon remembering, he was no wiser than Apollyon had seemed, though now I sensed a strong arrogance about him. I patiently replied, I suppose he knows you will never change. Otherwise, he'd have left that prophecy untold. And he's right in that regard, Satan said. I'll never accept him and repent. Then he annoyingly asked, What will you think when your Lord is made wrong? When it is I who wins the battle instead of he, your Lord will have still been made a liar. We both know that will never happen, the other Jacob finally spoke. He confidently approached Satan and stared him in the eyes, an action which garnered only anger from the dragon and his people. He patiently continued as they bear and became more and more uncomfortable. Where is it you travel? Is it to meet the Lord at Megiddo for this very battle you speak of? You have with you a mighty army. Do they realize what awaits them? Victory awaits us, one of his people yelled. The crowd rang out with voices. I could hear some yell, destroy them, and others saying, they're hateful scum, accepting only of their kind. I took a second to contemplate some things. What was about to happen to us? How could Satan and his followers see us, yet when they bear not God's number? I encouraged my group to huddle together, and, and I said, I think it best to ignore them and continue toward the waterfall. It's so close now for Jacob and I. But before I could say more, the serpent stepped uncomfortably close beside us and he quietly said, two of you are allowed to go, but I own the others. The computer programmer angrily revolted, yelling, nobody owns me, I write my own algorithms. To which Satan kindly replied, and that's precisely what I've always loved about you, my equal. He seemed pleasantly surprised. Wait, uh, you're okay with me worshiping you? Of course, Satan replied, kindly placing one hand on the computer programmer's shoulder and the other hand on the other man's shoulder. We're equal, he gently said. We worship ourselves. Don't listen to him, the other Jacob authoritatively reported. He's twisting truth. When we worship ourselves and anything other than our eternal father, our Lord and Savior, we are worshiping Satan. Which is why I added, we are either gods or Satans. And as I began to tear up for them, I added, the choice really is ours. I think his way sounds better, one of them unexpectedly replied. It was then I noticed neither of them seemed to have an issue with Satan touching them. I was in disbelief. Can you not remember, the other Jacob said to them, a look of sincere plea on his face, the horrid beast in the pit? Satan then said, oh, but wouldn't you like to see us the way only those with my number whom I've allowed can see us? I, for one, was confused over this. But it was the two non-Jacobs who beat me to responding. What does that mean, one asked. The other said, I suspected something like this. It happened when the sixth plague began, didn't it? But those of us who didn't yet, hadn't yet met Satan, you who bear his mark didn't notice because of the dark. Notice what, the other Jacob enthusiastically inquired. What happened that only they can see when the sixth plague began? Satan slowly pulled away from us and stood with the other group. A huge smile was on his face as he loudly snapped his fingers. 
Instantly, the other two could obviously see something we Jacobs could not. They pulled away and marveled over their surroundings, looks of astonishment on their faces, laughing aloud as they eventually began dancing with glee. Do not tell them what you see, the serpent authoritatively said over the noise. This is a great leisure only benefited to my equals. Let the curiosity of what you now behold haunt them the rest of their lives. For they haven't yet chosen, I responded, very much bothered at seeing my friends disappear into the now welcoming crowd. Oh, but it seems they have, Satan arrogantly replied. And it looks like they're so relieved by what I've given them, I very much doubt they'll ever give you or the desolate world they left a second thought. And as he and his followers began to move again away from us, he yelled out to us, you'll see whose side you should have chosen, my friends. But because I'm so gracious, I'll let you know something. At any time, if you should happen to change your minds between now and the great battle, your numbers will change to mine and you'll be able to see what the others see. The choice is yours. And with that, they wandered away from us, leaving we two alone as we began walking again toward the ever close waterfall. It wasn't long before he asked, what do you think they saw? I too had been pondering over this, I replied. I suspect to them maybe this place suddenly became a tropical paradise. I was thinking the same, he replied. Or maybe they have tanks and advanced weaponry with them. Maybe it's like before with the spaceships. When we finally reached the waterfall, we were delighted to find not only a great pool filled with fresh, cool, drinkable water, but that some other people, male and female, had gathered there, seemingly every bit as elated to be there as we were. There was a natural garden surrounding most sides of the pond. After a short while, we were kindly welcomed into the group, and we ecstatically welcomed and sampled every variety of fruit and vegetable we came across. This was without doubt the happiest and most comfortable we had been since the seventh trunk. We gazed at the waterfall from below and let it pour on our bodies, marveling over the great size of the floating city above us. Here where city and earth met, it felt like it hovered only a few hundred feet above us instead of several thousand. The waterfall lit up everything. The sky was brighter to us now than even before the final trunk but its warmth was very comfortable and our eyes were not bothered by its radiance. The others who of course were all named Jacob told us about their travels and transformations as we told them about ours. And we peacefully abided and worked together, eventually building for ourselves houses from the plants and earth and establishing our own little community. Months turned into years and before anyone knew it, we had lived off the waterfall for what felt like at least a few hundred years. There was no crime, no heated debates turned cruel or dangerous. We each felt we were all on the same page regarding the important matters, and with the other things we found ways to fairly compromise. Our system was not perfect, but its structure made sense because we all were related. We all bear the same number, honored the same Lord. It surprised us how much time had passed since the sixth plague had begun many years prior. We suspected this whole time Satan was out gathering soldiers for his army, and God was graciously giving everyone ample time to make their choice. We wondered how mighty Satan's army must have become, and <laughs> laughed at his, at his willful ignorance. Every day we prayed to God for guidance and protection as we scurried about our pleasant community, and we prayed for those who had not yet conformed to Satan, but who had also not accepted Jesus and found Jacob, those who were still dredging tiredly through the dark. We, of course, also prayed for those who unfortunately had conformed, and I, for one, often was saddened when I remembered my two friends. Newcomers wandered to the waterfall periodically throughout nearly every day. As the community had grown over the years, we eventually found ourselves numbering a great many, Yet the ever faithful waterfall never failed to abundantly provide for us all. We had set up schools and churches and held weekly training regiments. We had kept the Sabbath, which was every day when we honored the Lord Jesus, 
and refer to our memories of Bible scriptures to formulate our rules and policies and our politics. It seemed this not marish millennial reign had slowly transformed into somewhat of a beautiful utopia, a dream almost, and we often spoke of how undeserving we felt, praising the Lord for being so merciful and gracious to us in spite of our past crimes. But unfortunately, our delight was cut short one day when an angel of the Lord appeared before us and said, it is good to relish in God's gifts. However, isn't there still a great many people out there who have yet to find truth? Now that you're comfortably secure, the Lord wishes that you help those who are less fortunate find their way in the dark. And so after he departed, our troubles began when some of us disagreed with a decision to help the others. We had no special person helping make our struggles easier, they thought, amongst us all. Why should they? Tensions only grew when those of us who sided with Jacob's decisions boldly declared their words to be both selfish and blasphemous. This marked a clear enough ideological divide between us to soon enough evolved into two separate groups. We avoided one another throughout the day, and crude gossip began to spread. It wasn't long before even our, politi the, our political I mean, views were divided. There was those of us who truly wanted to make the Lord happy, and those who cared not if they disappointed him, it seemed, bending his fair rules to bring blessings to only themselves. The madness ended when finally those of us who truly loved the Lord banded together and viciously drove the others away from the community. The outcome matched the deed, we thought, and what instant relief we felt having them gone. But our joy was short-lived as the same angel of the Lord reappeared a few days later and disappointingly said to us, Your task was to bring more in, not drive more out. One of us kindly responded, It is them who do not love our Lord. The angel quickly replied, Yet you are the ones who fulfilled precisely the opposite of what the Lord wanted. What should we have done? We could not let them stay. If he was, I'm sorry, if we was to become missionaries for the Lord with them around, that would mean leaving our community in their hands each time we departed. And what would have been so wrong with that? The angel patiently inquired. Their only ideological difference was to stay instead of leave. I thought a second before realizing how irrational we had acted. This was when someone said they would have been great to keep behind to take care of our community while the rest of us ventured out to honor the Lord's wishes. That's what we should have done. That's what would have been a fair compromise, I suppose. But most importantly, our family would not be out wandering alone without food or water had we figured out a way to honor God instead of making ourselves happy. A heavy feeling rested on us as we each realized the error of our ways. The angel then said, smiling, But our Lord is crafty at turning what was meant for bad into something good. I asked, What does that mean? He replied, waving a hand toward his right, Look for yourselves. See what Jacob has accomplished. Sure enough, our eyes then beheld our once exiled brothers and sisters as they emerged from the far darkness and gleefully marched toward us. And beside some of them marched faces none of us recognized, those who had been left to wander many years in the void. We lovingly embraced our family and apologetically welcomed them back into our fair community. We dropped the left versus right ideology with politics and unanimously re-embraced our original fair system. Of course, ministering to the lost now was top of our priorities, and it made it easy with God regulating who could and could not enter the waterfall area, rendering any disputes we suffered truly temporary and over unimportant matters. Even more time passed before finally we knew the Battle of Armageddon was about to begin. This was when Michael the Archangel appeared before us, joyous to see us again, yet having about him a very stern and militarized stature. He authoritatively said, Jacob is a fearless warrior, and the moment you've been training for has arrived. He will come with useless handmade weapons and technology, 
but we and the angels and the body of the witnesses will conquer over him with only the Lord and our continuous faith in him as our weapons. He keeps his promises, someone yelled. Our faith is secure. Then so be it, Michael replied as he opened his wings and took to the skies. We followed after him, experiencing for the first time what it felt like to fly on our own with no vehicle. Part 777, the final. You should know by now how everything ends. Indeed, God was right to predict Satan would never accept truth, and the dragon was finally forever cast into the lake of fire, he and his many foolish followers. I learned it was not our presence which assisted the Lord Jesus in any way with destroying Satan and his army, nor was it our faith. The Father foresaw this event would occur long before the ages began, and the Son carried out his destiny, having all the capabilities of the Creator. But since Jacob is the eternal bride of the Lamb, whom he loves more than anything, it was our expression of love to him by standing beside him against Satan, which empowered him to destroy a certain creation he once loved dearly, and one he barely tolerated. That is, his stubborn and unfaithful, unapologetic ex-bride, and the hybridized offspring of Cain, who had for so long defiled his sanctuaries. It also must have been difficult for the Lord to destroy Satan, who at one time was a dear friend and faithful servant of the Lord's, back when his name was Lucifer, before he and the other unlawful angels had been banished from heaven. But of course the outcome matched the deed, and the old dragon got exactly what he deserved. My heart still breaks for those who failed to accept truth before the option was taken away from them, but they truly had every chance in the world, willfully denying everyone. If they weren't going to change by then, nothing would convince them. It was in their blood. In the end, there was a mighty earthquake, and in a flash, the Lord Jesus destroyed Satan and his army. Then the Lord united with we, his true bride, inside the pearly gates, where those of us who had never before entered New Jerusalem found ourselves in indescribable awe and comfort. It was just as the missionary had said, profoundly indescribable. I never could have known such sincere and genuine happiness was even possible. One day I walked alone with the Lord in the cool of the evening, beautiful woodsy paradise majestically surrounding us, crickets chirped, birds sang, a calm and soothing wind gently passed between us. I asked him, did my DNA ever really matter? He kindly replied, only because the enemy made it matter, partly by pretending to be Jacob and making a mockery out of my name. It was only right of my elect to peacefully combat Satan's lies by revealing the truth. The synagogue of Satan led the world astray, demanding respect and honor while persecuting those I love. Do you think a Gentile would exist without a Jew? But here in my fair kingdom, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, but only those who truly love truth, who truly love me as much as I love them. Had my true chosen ones been in authority all those years, there would have been no racism, no corruption, no agenda. All would have accepted my gifts and been equally blessed. I inquisitively responded, is this why you told me before when I was named Rabbi Paul that you were not my father, that I was of a different flock and that's why I couldn't hear your voice? He lovingly replied, before I was not speaking to Jacob, before I was speaking to who you were, who you chose to be, to Paul, I almost understand. He smiled and said, unless you're Jacob, you're what your name without me is. Unless you are cleansed by my blood and bear my holy number, you possess the corrupt blood of your forefathers, for better or for worse. He patiently continued as we walked. I listened ever so attentively. Because of the sins or good deeds of their forefathers, 
Each race had respectively been bestowed its own due burdens of blessings. When the Canaanites cursed themselves by following after their father, I blessed not their stolen home in Israel. When I blessed Israel for honoring me, I blessed dispersed Jacob, not my unfaithful and unapologetic ex-bride or her defiled land. Yet had you been of true Israelite descent and still not have known me, your fate would have been the same as the unapologetic sons of Cain, that is, the sons of Satan. Yes, I created every race of humans and called them good, except for the hybrid sons of the serpent who systematically created themselves. But never did I intend for the races to mix and eventually adopt part of the serpent's cursed seed. I lovingly leveled the playing field by introducing the new covenant, making it possible for the races to again become pure by renouncing the ways of evil and accepting my free gift of cleansing waters, the gift of equalizing blood through my sacrifice. But only those who accept me accepted this newfound uh, position of equality. The synagogue of Satan and his followers accepted me not simply because they preferred their lives of luxury over equality. I, slightly confused, asked, luxury? He gazed ahead and replied, under the old covenant, I made many promises to Jacob, even freeing them from slavery and giving them, them their own land. I loved and blessed them as much as they loved and blessed me forgiving them whenever they fell. They were my people out of all the nations on earth. Luxury. But then they started mixing with the very sons of Cain I had repeatedly commanded them to stay away from, and before long both blood and truth had been defiled. It became worse when they began attacking those who had not strayed from truth, who had not yet mixed, and persecuting them because of their race and religion. I became disgusted and divorced Jacob and the land and proposed the new marriage decree. Only those of all human races who truly know and love me qualify to be my bride. They and only they shall be the new Jacob, for the old Jacob has betrayed me. It matters not how much you sacrifice, how many times you pray, for I will not be pleased. Your temples of stone will not stand, for I now will abide in each individual soul who loves me. Your idols will be destroyed upon the appointed times, and the land you've made desolate will be too. Jacob's eternal inheritance will be my heavenly kingdom, which I have lovingly prepared for them. This is New Jerusalem, not anywhere on the earth, which will someday be destroyed. But instead of happily embracing this blessing, he continued. The sons of Cain and the now mixed sons of Jacob chose to pretend not to hear my voice. They told themselves in the world, this new decree is falsehood and continued believing they were wedded to me. This of course also meant refusing to acknowledge that all races were now forgiven of their sins and made equal, all who accepted and honored me. My ex systematically elevated herself above all others, demanding all who opposed them be killed. They used their position as leverage to manipulate the world. This was how they owned everything, and all world societies were an inescapable financial debt to them. They used what the public believed was my holy name to fulfill Satan's evil agenda. Also, this meant they created the Zionist image and fooled the world into bowing before them or else being labeled terrible names and persecuted by the very controlling systems they conceived and operated. Instead of striving for an equal existence under my fair rules, they invented their own rules, giving themselves the authority to enforce them justified on my original love for them, their original love for me. He stopped walking and sadly looked me in the eyes. So they turned what I had meant as a blessing to Jacob into a curse for the whole world, he said. Then he began walking again. I was happy. I said to him, I now understand, Lord, thank you. Then I inquired of another thought, signaling to my number tattoo. Since free will still exists, 
What's to say some people he'll hear won't hurt you again? He grinned, his deep blue eyes slightly catching the rays of the warmly glowing sky, his dark blonde hair gently swaying in the wind. I've foreseen the future, he calmly said. The outcome will always match the deed. And so we continued our peaceful stroll through paradise. At some point over the passing years, I somewhat jokingly thought to myself, if this is the matrix, I pray nobody ever pulls the plug. Now, if you'd rather not know the whole truth, uh, it's best to stop listening now. The only word you'll have missed could potentially bring you great confusion. Yet because they're true, they must be said nonetheless. I hope you do keep listening. One morning, it shockingly occurred to me that when I had first met Jesus long ago, he told me my name was never in the book of life. I thought, never? And this is coming from someone who knows the future? When I politely questioned him about this, he said, everything you've experienced since first meeting Jesus and your judge, since you fell from the holy city thousands of years ago, has been hell. I was in disbelief. I uttered, what? He patiently continued. They told you the choice was yours, and indeed it was. It was for my luck you soon thereafter chose me and don't even remember. My mind was spinning, my stomach sick. This isn't happening. He came close and revealed his true face to me. Every inch of my being shattered when suddenly I terrifyingly saw before me the ugly face of the very beast who had before stared up at me from the pit. I collapsed to the ground, barely conscious enough to hear him as he walked around me and hissed, you knew you were far too undeserving of the gift Jesus had granted you in our extremely true to life simulation. Just then I saw before me landing a huge spaceship and strange humanoid creatures emerged and surrounded us. These are my mediators, Satan said. They, along with my angels and those who chose me, rule this underworld. I threw up. I surely wasn't experiencing this. This surely wasn't happening. Explain what is happening, I wearily yelled. Satan laughed and replied, Oh, but only your grandest wishes. The chance to rule this beautiful kingdom beside me, my equal. Let God have his new Jerusalem. We've got something better. Just look around. I can choose any environment I wish just by the click of a button. You were wise to choose me over him. If so, I said, then why did I still have to go through the tribulation? I had to be sure you would make the cut. I thought a second and replied, but I chose Jesus in your simulation, not you. You just thought you were accepting Jesus, he quickly and arrogantly responded. But the whole time it was just little old me. I somehow found the strength to rediscover my feet. Looking him in the eyes, I confidently said, I know that can't be true. He seemed a little intimidated by my bold stature when he asked, how so? Because I recall the words of God's holy word and what Christ told me did not contradict. What you recall are memories of a reality that did not exist, he somewhat agitatedly replied. Things that were programmed in a computer to happen, inspired by your own memories of your past. Because you never personally studied the whole writings of Jesus, you eventually adopted only that which the others in our simulation told you, which was all in your head. How could the Lord love you when you didn't even truly know him? His words cut deeply as I realized how potentially true they could be. How should I know if he's lying when what he said seemed to make sense? It was true. I did not study God's word like I should have. Perhaps this was my punishment. Perhaps the outcome matched the deed. But I thought about the words of Jacob, my judge, and the words of Jesus during that time, and soon determined something wasn't right. You say the simulation began after I fell from the city, I asked him. He responded, yes. So has the millennial reign really ended? He replied, the moment in 
your simulation when Jesus destroyed me, that's when it really did end. Your simulation just now ended, by the way, when you realized who I was. Why didn't you just lie and keep pretending? Why did you have to destroy my perfect paradise? Because, he replied, I needed to know if you would ever find it in you to question the words of your Lord. It grew silent as I contemplated his words. Finally, I said, so you won the battle? He smiled greater than I had ever witnessed anyone smiling before and replied, I told you I would. I thought to myself, how could I know if these were all lies? Then it occurred to me, if Satan was thrown into the lake of fire, how was he then standing before me alive and well? I asked him, is this the lake of fire? He replied, of course not. This is the underworld, hell. I won the battle. I possess the world now, the whole world, and this place I've chosen for us is superior above all. Can someone look at my back and tell me if my number has changed? I asked. He laughed. There are no numbers here. Ha <laughs> ha. You've already chosen me. What need have I for numbers? Here we are equal. Here you are free to speak to me without bowing. I couldn't believe what I was experiencing. I was not happy or comfortable. Everything inside me wanted to escape and to think I once worshipped this imposter and stood for his agendas. I pondered Jesus's and my judge's words. They spoke before I was seemingly dishonestly sucked down to hell. His name was never in the Lamb's book of life, I recalled. Then I remembered what I was told by Jesus during the apparent simulation. You are not the person you used to be. I confidently looked the serpent in the eyes and said, Jesus said never because he wasn't speaking to me. He was speaking to Paul. Satan seemed annoyed when he responded, you are Paul. No, I'm not, he calmly retorted. My name is Jacob. You possess not Jacob's number. As you were told, your name was never in his glorious book. I anxiously pondered, wait, I read enough New Testament prophecy prophecy to know the dragon is destroyed in the end. I boldly faced and told the dragon with much authority behind my voice, much fire in my eyes. I witnessed as the Lord Jesus tossed you and your army into the eternal lake of fire. That's what was written should happen. And that's what happened. I will never believe your lies or serve you. In fact, I know that you and your people are now boiling in the lake of fire and that all of this isn't real. I immediately sensed the shift in his demeanor, broken cowardice. I continued inching closer and closer to him. I also know the earth was destroyed following the millennial reign, so there is no underworld. Then out of nowhere, something unexpected happened. Listen up, dear listener, for this was when I woke up. Indeed, as I terrifyingly glanced around, I saw that I had never left my apartment, that I was still laying on the living room couch with an open sports magazine across my chest. The clock faintly ticked in the distance and the air conditioning was running, blowing a pleasant drift across my body from the air vent above my head. My emotions settled. I felt comfortable. I slowly sat up and touched my forehead. It was all a dream, I relievedly said aloud to myself. Yet I wasn't sure if I was happy or sad it had ended. Then it occurred to me that I was wearing a yarmulke on my head. Before the dream, I'd been honoring the Sabbath, or what I'd believed was the Sabbath. Few thoughts passed before I suddenly found myself in a body I did not recognize. I broke the Sabbath law by jumping to my feet. For the longest time, I wasn't sure if I wanted to move, so I stood in one spot and became absorbed in my own thoughts. I have a very real decision to make, I desperately thought. Just then, I heard some people at the front door, and I uneasily watched as they unlocked the door and walked in, tucking their face masks away in the process. It was my roommates and some friends, my friends from the synagogue and elsewhere, and they appeared excited to greet me. Rabbi Paul, my friend, the ex-Catholic explained as she ran up to me, we have the best news. 
Then another, the Islamic computer programmer, excitedly said, We are brothers. I've got your back every step of the way. It was then when I responded, possibly the most confused look on my face. What happened? The ex-Catholic then exclaimed, lifting her hands to the heavens, The Messiah has spoken. He has given us a precise date. He will finally show his face to us in the world in just 12 mornings. My emotions were dry. I stood still the whole time trying to put my thoughts together. This was when my friend, the true Christian, stepped forward and excitedly said, You know what this means, brother? Indeed, I did know. As I stood there hearing their voices and feeling their close presence, it became like a thick echo as my mind tried to focus. I must have passed out. I was awakened by the noise of a running vehicle. I looked around to find that I had been buckled into the front passenger seat of my friend, the Christian's SUV, who also was driving. I instantly recognized his Christian cross dangling from the rearview mirror, and we were alone. When he saw that I was awake, a look of relief appeared on his mask-covered face as he exclaimed, Praise the Lord, brother, we thought we had lost you. I straightened up in the seat and cleared my throat as I awkwardly responded, No, I, I'm still here. That's when I uneasily realized I, too, was wearing a face mask. He hesitantly asked, Do you still need to go to the hospital? I realized then while we were in the car. I replied, giving him a nervous half-smile, which he didn't see anyway. No, I'll be fine. Thanks anyway. I normally wouldn't have asked, he said, and just have taken you anyway, but considering how close we are to the meeting, I don't think we should take unnecessary chances. What time does it start? I nervously asked, trying my hardest to contain my emotions. He excitedly replied, at seven o'clock, in 25 minutes, we have just enough time to barely get there. My worst nightmare came true. I thought, what am I going to tell them? My friend then said, listen up, as he turned up the radio volume. We listened as the news of the pandemic and global destruction worsened as the most current ratio of vaccinated versus unvaccinated numbers were broadcasted for the world to hear. There was a strong voice against the nonconformers who were painted as causing the rest of society to require face masks and social distance, while also adding... Their unvaccinated blood is causing the rest of us endless sorrows. Why can't they see what we can see? When we arrived at the place where the meeting was held, I was thankfully able to hide my emotions under my mask. Otherwise, all the many enthusiastic people who safely and warmly greeted me would have been aware of the deep distress I was under. And then the dreaded moment came. When I was called to stand before the large crowd, I slowly walked to the podium, the sound of applause ringing aloud, the flashing of cameras all around. I stood there, Torah in hand, and waited until their applause died down. My thoughts during this much appreciated break were, if I conform to Satan, the outcome will match the deed and many innocent people will suffer, including eventually myself. And I thought, but if I stand for Christ, which is what I so desperately want to do, my status with this very crowd of people and absolutely everyone I love and everything we had worked to accomplish as a team will instantly shatter before all our eyes, before national television. I thought, I know what the right choice is. I'm going to make it. As the applause ended, I moved closer to the microphone and nervously uttered these words. I've given this much thought and I've decided I, just then I remembered the many lives I had helped bring into the understanding and acceptance of the Lord during what I then could only assume was a very realistic dream of the millennial reign. Yet somehow I knew it was much more than a dream. I remembered what someone had told me long ago, that absolutely everything serves a purpose. And I remembered how the Lord Jesus for so long patiently 
followed and allowed both the Canaanites and their fathers to live, having witnessed their future actions, good and evil. Then I realized what I experienced was not a dream. It was a glimpse into my own future. I asked myself, but is it written? Is there a way to be rid of this curse before death? I thought, internally sobbing, must it be I who fulfills this prophecy? But I realized the outcome was already meeting the deed, that irregardless of what I said to the world, the monster I had created was already far too strong for any of us to stop. At this point, I was but merely a front man, a poster child for the cause. It occurred to me, the only real choices I have are either to step down and let them find another idol to represent them, which they will, or I made my decision as I spoke calmly into the microphone and said to them, I'm pleased to announce the Zionist age of global utopia has finally arrived. The Zagu has been officially formulated. All world nations are in agreement and all necessary contracts have been signed. In precisely 12 days from now, the, I cleared my throat, <clears throat> Messiah will appear to fulfill prophecy and take over as global king. And finally, the plagues and wars will cease. As I spoke to them, I knew I would secretly forever hold to the truth. I would always know that it was in fact true. Yet I could thankfully henceforth rely on a mask to hide my oppressed and distraught outward expressions. I lowly thought to myself, whatever my outcome, whatever nightmares this shall cause, I am already forever deserving of the very worst I can imagine. I shall choose to endure the millennial reign as I deserve. And if my judge and the Lord should happen to decide I'm deserving of even worse, I think it only logical to say I am deserving of that fate too. This has been 11000100. Also known as the guilt of a Jew. Sincerely, Paul. Good day, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sean Reynolds, and I have for you here a very extremely special story uh, that I want to share with you. Um, this story has deep meaning. It, I believe, accomplishes in answering many of life's toughest questions, one of which being, what is the purpose of life? And another being, well, why didn't God just kill Satan a long time ago and rid us of, you know, all of the pain and suffering that we've had to endure over the years? You'll find that the story is very true to the Bible. Um, and in fact, I encourage all of you to listen very attentively to every word because every single word I assure you has meaning every single word of this story has meaning every number every name every event that occurs and I encourage you to go and study God's holy word in accurate interpretation of course and I'm of course referring to end times prophecy now and uh, go through and see for yourself how true to scripture this story actually is. And I encourage you lastly to put yourself in these characters' shoes because that's the point, okay? Um, and without further ado, I'm going to jump into this. The name of the story is called 11000100. Also known as the guilt of a Jew. Now, I will try to refrain from interjecting anything outside of what has been written in this story. And so you'll have to really pay attention in order to understand the ending. Because I'm telling you right now, the ending is deep. It is so, so deep. And unless you really pay attention, uh, I think... 
think that maybe a lot of people won't understand it. But uh, yeah, let's begin. <laughs> 